Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 39. Hear now the word of the Lord as he speaks through the Apostle Paul. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation awaits with eager longing for the revelation of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is God's holy and inspired word. Thanks be to him. How is it that some people become Christians and live their life in a particular way and others don't? How is it that some people become Christians and live their life in a particular way and others don't? Previously, in the beginning of this sermon series, we heard about election. Election, remember, is God's choosing some in Christ Jesus, predestinating them for redemption and providentially ordering, arranging all things so that in time they would be redeemed. That was our first topic in this sermon series. And tonight, the question that we're trying to understand is, how is it that the elect... The redeemed become Christians and live in a particular way. How does this happen? 
That's the question that we're going to answer tonight. And so the topic tonight is effectual calling and union with Christ. Effectual calling and union with Christ. In a sense, this is the beginning of the Christian life. Effectual calling and union with Christ. And tonight we're going to see that those who are chosen in Christ are, in time, called, united to Christ, and partake in His benefits and produce fruit. Those who are chosen in Christ are, in time, called, united to Christ, and partake in His benefits and produce fruit. In order to see this, first we're going to orient ourselves to where we are in the order of salvation. Second, we'll define our terms. In particular, tonight, outward calling, effectual calling, and union with Christ. And third, we'll consider the biblical data. We'll find out if the reform just made these doctrines up or if it's actually biblical. Again, those who are chosen in Christ are in time called, united to Christ, and partake in His benefits and produce fruit. We're going to orient ourselves in the order of salvation, see where we are. Then we'll define our terms, outward calling, effectual calling, and union with Christ. And then we'll consider the biblical data. So let's begin by understanding where we are in the order of salvation. Remember now, the order of salvation is how the Reformed churches historically talk about redemption applied. Redemption applied. Before time, God chose a people for himself. And the Father gave those people to Christ in order that he would redeem them by his life, death, resurrection. And we call that redemption accomplished. The work of Christ in his incarnation, perfect life, atoning death, resurrection, that is redemption accomplished. And then the Holy Spirit applies that work of redemption to us in time, and we call this redemption applied. And there is a certain logical order to how redemption is applied, and we call this the order of salvation. And again, if you're not getting all the terms, that's okay. It took me a really long time uh, to not feel like there was a fire hose coming at me when I, when I tried to learn about these things. And there's not going to be a quiz. There's no exam on this. Now, the basic structure of the order of salvation, the basic structure of the order of salvation can be seen in our Romans reading. For those whom God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So look at all those terms that we have here. Foreknown, in other words, chosen. Then predestined. And then called. And then justified. And finally, glorified. English, uh, Puritan, Reformer William Perkins, also known as the architect of Puritanism, called this the golden chain of salvation. And by using the rest of the Holy Scriptures, the Reformers filled in the rest of the aspects of salvation. The ones that aren't listed here, you know, Paul lists a few, but he doesn't list them all here. And so what the Reformers did was they filled in the rest logically so that what we have is election, Calling, union with Christ, regeneration, faith and repentance, justification, adoption, sanctification, preservation, and glorification. And there's a logical order to this. You know, who are the ones who are called? The ones who are chosen in Christ. Who are the ones who are united to Christ? The ones who are effectually called. Who are the ones who are regenerated? Those who are united to Christ. Who are the ones who are given faith and able to repent? 
the ones who are regenerated. Who are the ones who are justified? The ones who believe and repent. Who are the ones who are adopted? The ones who have been justified. Who are the ones who are being sanctified? The ones who are justified and adopted. Who are the ones who are preserved? The ones who are justified, adopted, sanctified. And who are the ones who are glorified? The ones who have all those things. Do you see why there's a logical order to the order of salvation or redemption applied? So redemption is accomplished by the work of Christ. All of the work that he did. And then, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that work is applied to us. The good news of Christ, the gospel, is applied to us so that we would be redeemed. And the Holy Spirit does this in a logical order. The order of salvation. Okay? So that's what we're talking about. So where are we in this wonderful order of salvation? We're at the beginning. The beginning of the Christian life. Effectual calling and union with Christ. You can't have regeneration. You can't have faith and repentance. You can't have uh, justification, adoption, sanctification, preservation, glorification without this. Effectual calling and union with Christ. All of those things are benefits that flow from effectual calling and union with Christ. So it's a very important step. It's the beginning, in a sense, it's the beginning of the Christian life. So where are we? We're after election, and we're now at effectual calling and union with Christ. That's orienting ourselves, getting our bearings. And so now we move into our second consideration tonight, a definition of our terms. We should know what these terms mean, right? We hear them all the time. We read about them in Scripture. I say them quite often. So what do they mean? We're going to look first at the outward calling. Then we'll look at the effectual calling. And third, we'll look at union with Christ. Christ. There's plenty of room in here for you to take notes, by the way. Right there. So first, let's take a look at the outward calling. What is this? This is the outward or external call, also known as the preaching of the gospel. The preaching of the gospel. Repent and believe. Here's the good news of Christ. Turn from your sin and turn to God. So when the word is read and preached and expounded upon, when the gospel is clearly articulated as the good news of Jesus Christ for your redemption, his coming in the flesh, his perfect obedience, his atoning death, his resurrection, his ascension, his enthronement, when it's preached, it's called the outward call, also sometimes called the free offer of the gospel. That's what the Dutch Reform called it. The free offer of the gospel. You know what they said at Dort? They said the gospel needs to be preached promiscuously. We often think promiscuous is bad. Well, not when it comes to the free offer of the gospel. It needs to be preached everywhere to everyone. Why? So that all the elect would be called. So that all the elect would be called. The free offer of the gospel. It's it's the preaching of the word. It's the preaching of the gospel. As our Lord Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called. The offer of life in the gospel is preached. The call goes out, and the outward call is presented to all the nations. And all the elect are brought in through the outward call. So that call goes out because that's how God has decided he is going to save his people through the ministry of the word. Ministry of the Word. Remember we say word, sacrament, prayer. Word, sacrament, prayer. The ministry of the Word is so important because that's how God has decided He's going to save His people. Through the ministry of the Word. Paul says this in Romans 10, 14. I know we're not at the biblical data yet, but just so you can get an idea. How then will they call on Him, that is God, uh, excuse me, how then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? In other words, someone needs to preach the gospel in order for the elect to be brought in. That's the point. These are rhetorical questions saying it can't happen. The word needs to be preached. The gospel call needs to go out promiscuously to the nations. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? That's why it's so important to train and ordain people to go preach the gospel to the nations. As it is written, he says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. 
but they have not all obeyed the gospel. See, many are called, few are chosen. For as Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? Thus, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. This is the call, the free offer of the gospel. In order for God's people to come to faith, the external call, that outward gospel preaching, must go forth. Ministers of the gospel must preach the gospel. In order that the Holy Spirit would work through the gospel preaching, and what's that called? The Holy Spirit working through the gospel preaching. What's that called? Well, that well actually, it's the beginning of redemption applied, right? And that brings us to our second point effectual calling. So it goes from being just an outward call to an inward call. A call that is now effectual. That's what the Holy Spirit does. See, the Spirit affects union with Christ. The Spirit works through the ministry of the Word in order to unite us to Christ, in order to regenerate us, as we'll see next week, in order to give us faith that we would repent and be justified. Effectual calling. It's the beginning of the Christian life. It's when somebody goes from merely hearing it to actually having that gospel call become effectual for their salvation. Redemption applied. Now at the top of the liturgy, we can see how our Reformed confessional standards talk about effectual calling. We've got the Westminster Shorter Catechism, you know, that thing that all Presbyterian children know by heart because they were catechized in it. That thing that I would encourage all of us to study and learn. Uh, I learned it because I had to, but I would recommend you know, learning it for your own spiritual edification. Question 30 says this, The Spirit applieth to us the redemption purchased by Christ. Isn't it nice when you see that I'm not just making terms up? The Spirit applieth to us the redemption purchased by Christ by working faith in us and uniting us to Christ in our effectual calling. Effectual calling. Or, as the confession describes it, all those whom God hath predestined unto Christ. So it's going back to election. All those whom God hath predestined unto Christ and those only, those only, only he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time effectually to call by his word and spirit. The spirit works through the word. God effectually calls by his word and spirit out of that state of sin and death in which we are by nature unto grace and salvation by Jesus Christ. Confession continues. Whereas others not elected although they may be called by the ministry of the word outwardly, the free offer of the gospel, yet they never truly come to Christ and therefore cannot be saved. This is why some people hear the preaching of the word and their only response to it is, it's too long. You're taking too much time. Because Nothing is happening. It's only external. It's hitting their ears and falling to the ground. It's hitting their heart and falling to the ground. This is why many people leave the church. This is why many people don't make the Lord's Day a priority. Many are called. Few are chosen. Hey, those aren't my words. It's the words of Christ. And he's talking about the kingdom of God and the great feast that everyone is invited to. Many are called. Few are chosen. Because even though some hear that gospel call, that outward call, nothing is happening to them spiritually. They're still dead. They're not alive in Christ. Christ and his spirit have not taken residence in that person. No effectual call, and thus, no union with Christ. It's true. Hard to hear, but true. And that brings us to our third term, union with Christ. 
what is union with Christ? Union with Christ is that vital, unbreakable spiritual union that believers have with Christ. Jesus Christ. All those who are chosen in Christ are in time by the Spirit united to Him in their effectual calling. Our larger catechism describes this union. It says, the communion in grace, it's talking about union with Christ, which the members of the invisible church have with Christ, is their partaking of the virtue of His mediation in their justification, adoption, and sanctification, and whatever else in this life manifests their union with Him. And so this gets to the benefits of and manifestation of or fruit of the union which believers have with Christ. Union manifests itself in benefits, in fruit. That brings us to our final consideration this evening. We know where we are in the order of salvation. It's the beginning of the Christian life. Effectual calling and union with Him. We've defined our terms. The outward gospel call. The effectual call when the Holy Spirit works through the preaching of the gospel, uniting us to Christ and union with Christ, that vital, unbreakable spiritual union that the elect have with Christ. And now we come to our final consideration. Is all of this biblical? Or did the Reformed just make it up? Because they were bored, you know? There wasn't a lot to do back then, right? There was no football yet. No baseball. So is this made up or is it in the Bible? First... Consider what the scriptures say about the external call, the preaching of the gospel. We've already heard the words of Christ from Matthew twenty two fourteen. Many are called and few are chosen. And we've heard the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 10. How are they to believe in whom, whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? For faith comes through hearing and hearing the word of Christ. But in case that's not enough, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 2, 13 and 14 writes this to the Thessalonians. He says, we ought always to give thanks to God for you. Why? Because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through the setting apart by the Spirit. For to this He has called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have been set apart by the Holy Spirit through the gospel. Through the gospel, God has set us apart by His Spirit. Effectual calling comes through the gospel. Paul says it right there. As the Lord speaks through Isaiah in Isaiah 55, 10, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return void, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and will succeed in the thing for which I have sent it. For those who are effectually called, the Spirit works through the gospel preaching and does not return void. And this is certain. It's not if, it's not maybe. This is certain. As the Apostle Paul said in Romans 8.30, those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. In time through the preaching of the word, and the Spirit working through that free offer of the gospel, God draws us to Himself. The Lord Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. John 6.44 And that gets to the heart of our union with Christ, doesn't it? Those who are chosen in Christ are in time by the powerful operation of the Spirit through the ministry of the Word drawn into Christ, into this life-giving, unbreakable spiritual union with Jesus. As the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 8 and following, our Lord Jesus Christ will sustain you to the end. It's unbreakable. That's really good news, isn't it? Once we're united to Christ, we can't be ununited. He will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. For God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, 
Jesus Christ our Lord, Christians have been called into fellowship with Jesus, union with Christ. There's not a single Christian in the world, there's not a single one of the elect who is not united to Christ. And once united to Christ, no one can snatch us out of his hands. Remember what Jesus said? My Father has a good grip. You're not going anywhere. So the benefits of Christ, the benefits of Christ that believers have because of their union look like this. It flows out of our union and it's regeneration. It's having faith. It's turning from our sin. It's being declared righteous. It's being sanctified and preserved through this life and in the future glorification. These are benefits that we receive because we're united to Christ. Think of that great opening of the Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesians, which I did not read tonight. I was going to, but I'll read it here. Or at least I'll go through some of the points that he makes. Everything, Ephesians chapter 1, 3 and following, everything is tied to what? Union with Christ. Everything's tied to it. He says this, We've been chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world to be His holy people. We've been predestined for adoption through Jesus Christ. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. In Him, we have an eternal inheritance. In Him, we have the down payment, which is the Holy Spirit sealed to us. Now, look at the terms that Paul uses. In Christ, in the Beloved, through Christ, in Him, in Him. Over and over, he uses these terms. What are these terms? It's union with Christ language. So important. That's why the Apostle Paul can say things like we heard in Romans 8. For I consider that the suffering of this present time is not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. 8.26 And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. Verse 28. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Verse 31. And who will bring any charge against God's elect? Verse 33. And here's the best one. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation? Distress? Persecution? Persecution? Famine, nakedness, danger, the sword. Who will separate us? No one. For in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Union with Christ language. It's through Christ. Through him we are more than conquerors. And so as those who have been chosen in Christ to be holy and blameless before him, there's something that, is set, that sets us apart. Has to. There's something that is proof that we are united to Christ. What do you think it is? We talked about it this morning in Sunday school, and I said, I didn't want to use the word because we're going to be talking about it tonight. It's fruit. Fruit. We receive the benefits, and therefore we produce the fruit because we're united to the vine. There's no other option. We have to. What is this fruit? This fruit is good works. Wait a second. I thought we were reformed. We don't believe in good works. We don't believe in good works in order to be saved. We believe in good works as a result and necessary consequence of being saved. If we're united to Christ, how can we not produce the fruit of the Spirit? How can we not be obedient to Christ and His Word? How can we not? Consider what our confession says. Chapter 16, paragraph 2. This is a really helpful paragraph about good works. And it's something that I often highlight. Good works done in obedience to God's commandments. Not stuff that we just make up. right? Not the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th commandments. It's obedience to the things that God has actually commanded. These are the fruit and evidence of a true and lively faith. It's evidence that we're united to Christ. Are you united to Christ? Yes. 
How do you know? Because I love to obey God. I love to produce fruit. And by this fruit, believers manifest their thankfulness, strengthen their assurance, edify their brethren. That means build up others. Adorn the profession of the gospel. In other words, we profess the gospel, but do we really believe it? Well, the fruit, the good works, show that we do. It stops the mouths of adversaries, and it glorifies God, whose workmanship they are. And that's important to remember, too. These good works, this fruit, comes from being united to Christ. It's the fruit of the Spirit. For they are His work, they are His workmanship, and we've been created in Christ Jesus for that very purpose, that having fruit unto holiness, we may have the end, eternal life. In other words, glorification. After all, wasn't it our Lord Jesus Christ who said this? I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. But every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it would bear more fruit. He's talking about those who are united to him. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Well, but I thought that non-believer is producing good works. It seems like they're doing good things. Nope, sorry, they're not. Because they're doing it for all the wrong reasons. Whatever good works it looks like they may be producing, they're false. Good works are produced by Christians who are united to Christ in obedience to, to His commands. Abide in me and I in you. Produce the fruit of the Spirit. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. If the branch, us, isn't united to the vine, it will not produce fruit. Branches only produce fruit when they're united to the vine. Neither can you, he says, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears a little bit of fruit. A tiny bit of fruit? No, that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And I love what he says here, just in case, you know, we're tempted to be Arminian. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask my father in his name, he would give it to you. These things I command so that you would love one another. John 15. What's Jesus talking about? He's talking about our union with him and the fruit that is necessarily produced by being united to the vine, Christ. So we come back to our original question, which was, how is it that some people become Christians and live their life in a particular way while others don't? Because we have been effectually called and united to Christ. And so we've considered where we are in the order of salvation, effectual calling in union with Christ, the beginning of the Christian life. We've defined our term so that now we understand what the outward calling is, what the effectual, effectual calling is when the Spirit works through the preaching of the gospel, uniting us to Christ, and we understand union with Christ. That vital, unbreakable spiritual union that the elect have with Christ. And we've seen that this is indeed biblical. And therefore, we can conclude that those who are chosen in Christ are, in time, called, united to Christ, and partake in his benefits and produce the fruit of union with him. Thanks be to God that he has effectually called us, united us to Christ by the preaching of the gospel and gives us the benefits, those wonderful benefits that flow from union with Christ, namely justification, adoption, sanctification, glorification, and the fruits thereof. Amen.